One ringy dingy. Two ringy dingies. Thank you for calling Dibolitech customer service. This is Igora, your customer service misrepresentative. How may I be of disservice? Yeah, I would like to register a complaint about a television that I bought from your company about a month ago. Oh, yay, I love fielding complaints. How did our product interfere with your worthless, meaningless existence? Well, I'll give you credit. You don't even pretend to care about your customers. Now, that's not fair. Of course we care. <laughs> If we don't have at least one complaint daily on how our products ruin the life of our customers, we don't get our bonuses. So come on, spill it. By the way, this call may be recorded to ensure we have given you the appropriate waste of time. Now, how may I be unhelpful? Okay, so about two weeks ago, an alien came through my TV, made himself at home, and proceeded to eat me out of house and home. But... That's not my complaint. I've grown accustomed to him. My complaint is my dad came over to watch Crocodile Dundee, and now, for some reason, he's talking like an Australian. Oh, bollocks. Are you just pulling the raw prawn? Bring us a slab of stubbies. We'll be mic in a minute. Come on, mate. Did you hear that? Is that even English? Now calm down. Sir, this sounds like a common case of electro Aussie possession. What? Basically, a person in Australia died watching our product, and his soul got trapped in the electronic waves. Tell me, did you purchase your TV new or used? Um, used? Okay, so it must have belonged to someone from Australia. I hope you enjoy your new Aussie companion. No, I don't want an Aussie companion. Trust me, I knew a lot of... Australians in the Navy, and they can outdrink me every time, and they can go for all night. I like my sleep. How do I get my dad back? You mean you want to reverse the possession? Yes! All right, sir. All you have to do is call the spirit home. Just find something that reminds it of home and give it to him. Like a song, a piece of clothing, some food. Okay, food. I can do that. Bye. So, mate, um, where are you from originally? Hi, oh, mate. Oh, I'm just now uh, broken down from Sweet Adelaide. You know, just down the way, you know? Okay. That's a start. <laughs> Hey y'all, I'm Derek. Welcome to Bad Movie Friday Night. Well, my dad has been possessed by an Australian stereotype, and I need to make something special in order to free the spirit. But before I get into any of that, I need to tell you a little bit about parody. Parody films are a subgenre of comedy where the common tropes of another genre are exaggerated or contorted to produce humor. Parody films have been around for almost as long as film itself. The first movie to be considered a parody was The Little Train Robbery, a 1905 film parodying The Great Train Robbery, which took the original script but replaced the train robbers with children. Parody has continued in film until the present day. The most popular in the subgenre, probably being the classic Airplane, which masterfully alters the tropes of a disaster film to create a timeless piece of hilarity. So what does this have to do with the movie today? We're watching an early 90s parody of horror films, in particular, The Exorcist. The movie is called Repossessed, and since I have to save my father's soul, I am making a classic Australian food that's still found in Adelaide today as a street food. It's called a meat pie floater. It's a fried meat pie on top of a thick pea soup, or mushy peas. I'm pretty sure that this was started as a dare, but it actually tastes pretty good. 
Hey mate, meat pie flatters are actually a traditional English miners' food. They came to Australia with the colonists and the prisoners and they became the national food. Just get you. Facts straight mate. You know, for posterity. Uh, no worries mate. So right now I'm just finishing the pea soup. I took a smoked ham hock and boiled it in some chicken stock until the meat came off the bone. Then I just removed the bone and threw in some dried green peas and a dash of Tabasco. So let's get started. Our movie begins with shots of a staircase in a house, where Father May I, played by Leslie Nielsen, has just finished exercising a girl off screen. Then we get our first exaggerated trope. After the credits, we learn it's 17 years later, which actually is kind of clever, I think. You see, this is supposed to be a spoof sequel of The Exorcist, which came out in 1973. This movie came out in 1990, exactly 17 years later. Cute little nod to the original. Anyway, Father May I is giving a lecture at a college, literally telling the story of the movie. Okay, so I have the pea soup on warm right now, so I'm going to start on the pastry. This is called a rough puff pastry. Reason being is because you still get all the nice flaky layers you expect out of pastry, but without the time consuming lamination that is required for full puff. So in this bowl, I just have some flour and some salt, and then I'm just gonna cut in some butter. And when it looks like it's a coarse meal, I'm going to start adding in a tablespoon of ice cold water at a time, just until it becomes um, solid. Then I'm going to form it into a bowl and wrap it in cling film, and then I'm going to set it in the fridge for about an hour to rest. So we finally get to the present day story, where we meet Nancy, played by Linda Blair, who gets possessed while watching TV. She decides to go to the doctor and get some tests done, but that leads to nowhere but some shtick. So finally she goes to church and meets Father Luke Brophy, played by Anthony Stark, who has only done bit parts in television since this movie. So Father Luke comes to her house and decides she's possessed, and then tries to get a sanction to exercise her again after being turned down for help from Father May I. That's where we officially meet a couple of televangelists who succeed in getting the sanction from the church by promising to televise the event. Because nothing is better for a sacred rite than to televise it. it adds a bit of gravitas, don't you think? Okay, so the peas are going well, the pastry is chilling, so let's start on the stuffing. Now, normally this is topped with ketchup, but I'm not that brave. So I'm just going to do something a little different instead. So, in this pan, I'm sautéing some carrots and onions and a tablespoon of butter. To that, I'm going to add a tablespoon of flour. Mix it together to make a roux. Then I'm going to add a can of tomato sauce. A little bit of Worcestershire sauce. and some salt and pepper. And then I'm going to add in some beef that I've already browned and drained. Then we're just gonna let this thicken and take it off the heat until it's ready to be used. So, the church is all on board for the televised exorcism, and we get to the night of the ceremony, which only exists so they can get a Jack LaLanne cameo. Seriously, what does he have to do with exorcisms? After some tomfoolery with some special effects, we find out the exorcism has the largest home viewing audience in television history, and the devil makes her move. Father Brophy calls out for all men of God to come out to the studio, which they do, including the Pope, and they are there 
for only one specific reason, which will be explained shortly. So, the devil decides to hold off on world domination until she has a showdown with Father May I, which is being commentated on by Jesse the Body Ventura and Mean Gene Okerlund, because in the early 90s, WrestleMania is life, y'all! So let's fry these pies up. So I've already rolled out my dough, so it's a little bit thicker than a wafer. And I'm going to take some of our stuffing, put it right on one side. And we're just going to seal it up like we did with the ravioli for um, Cellar Dweller. Once those are all put together, we're going to introduce these to the oil. And I've got to hurry this up because my Australian guy is watching the Baba Duke, and we're almost out of time. So, May I finally comes down to battle the devil, and the battle consists of a lot of goofy bits and some old fashioned Hollywood stereotyping. The priests are at the end of their ropes, so they figure they should just try rock and roll. Which leads to the only reason all the men of the cloth show up to the studio. This music video makes fun of the popular music videos of the period, and it is completely dated. But still, it's fun to see the Pope play a guitar and try to lip sync. Well, the devil is exercised, and that leads us to Mayai, Brophy, and Nancy standing in front of the class and throwing up pea soup all over an annoying student. And the pies are done. So we're going to get us ourselves a little bowl of the pea soup. Take the pie. Just put it on top. Hope this is good enough. Alright, now this is a proper knife. Gutting gators in no time. Oh! Here you go, mate. Some proper tucker. We'll see about that. Hmm. That's truth. Now this reminds me of the past streets of Adelaide. Now we and mates, me, we'd be out to the pubs close and we'd stagger in home. We'd stop over at Bruce and Sanger. Have a f bowl of this, it'd be wondrous. You know, kind of makes me want to go home. Oh my, what a what look. Why am I wearing a hat, or more specifically, why am I wearing a hat with uh, corks on it? Uh, oh, am I telling them what the hell happened here? You were possessed by a blatantly Australian stereotype who wouldn't leave you until he ate a meat pie floater. Okay, uh, well, it must be Monday then. <laughs> so, final thoughts on the movie. Well, what movie were we watching? Repossessed. Oh god, I thought I forgot that even existed. So did everyone else. I first saw this movie when I was 13. It was a late night spot holder on HBO, and I stayed up a lot later than I should have to watch it. And I thought it was hilarious. Looking back on it now, I know this is a stupid movie. Is it timeless? Is it thought provoking? Is it highbrow? No. This is a period piece, steeped in references to the time period. You don't really have to think hard to watch it. In fact, you watch it to turn your brain off. The humor is blue and very lowbrow, the epitome of frat boy humor, including gratuitous female nudity. There's a lot of shtick, and it never takes a break. There's no real character development. Everyone's basically explained as if you're reading the back of a trading card. The plot takes a back seat to all the jokes, and many of them aren't written exceedingly well. The acting is over the top, 
but that's to be expected in a parody film. Also, the breaking of the fourth wall, which does work sometimes, does get a little bit tiring the longer you watch this movie. It's not particularly a good film, but it's still a better parody film than the later scary movie films, or epic movie, and especially not another date movie. I still recommend it for a viewing party because it is entertaining. You may not get all the topical humor unless you know about the time period, but there are plenty of visual gags that will get you a chuckle every now and again. So, gather all your friends, eat some pea soup, turn off your brain, and laugh. Well, thanks for stopping by, thanks for tuning in, and come back next week for our Thanksgiving special, where we take our first trip to Tromaville. Bye, y'all.